Sodium and chlorides produced water. Probably the number one battle that, that we deal with in a lot of explorations around the world. Sodium and chloride is an element. I can't consume it. I can't degrade it. So what am I doing with it? Well, before I tell you what I'm doing with it, let's kind of look at some of the things that it does. As I mentioned before, most of our soils have some sort of clay content in it, especially in exploration areas or your, your, your pads because clay is used for stabilizing. So one of the first things that salt does, because it's positively charged, is it's going to react with the charges in clay that are negative. The negative charges naturally push the clay molecules apart and keep them apart. So moisture will go down and through, the soil is healthy, you can grow things, moisture flows, it's all nice. Within hours of salt hitting clay soils, it's going to start reacting. The positive charge goes to the negative charge, it pulls it out, that clay starts collapsing. Has anybody ever noticed after a production water spill, moisture kind of starts running over those areas where that produced water was? Why? Because the sodium in it has locked up the soils. It now isn't allowing moisture to go down and through. Well, that's actually the number one cause of death to the plants. Not the sodium or the chlorides that's really involved. Obviously, if you have high levels, the plant's not going to like it. But it's not the number one cause. What happens is your soil now no longer can get the natural moisture going in and out of the plant tissue and in and out of the roots. What happens is all the moisture starts getting pulled out of the plant because everything's drying up around it. Moisture can't get to it. So the soil naturally starts reversing that process. So now you got too much moisture being pulled out of the plant and plants generally die because they dehydrate. That's the general number one cause that happens. So now you have the soils that are all nice and tight. Moisture's not getting down and through. Nutrients can't get to the plants. Moisture can't get to the plants. And that's what happens, the plant dies. And because you don't have moisture there, you're not gonna be able to easily revegetate it. Even if you cultivate it, open it up, flush it. The problem is, is that the Sodium has already done its job, and it isn't moving. So we have to have a method to go ahead and desorb that sodium and chloride. Now on the chloride side, chloride is negatively charged. So if we have a product that can take care of salt, nine times out of 10, it's not gonna do a whole lot to chloride. In the chloride portion of of most remediation processes are more scrutinized by regulators, even though they still are concerned about the sodium, chlorides is generally that one that's very difficult to get within a regulatory range. Because again, I'm not consuming it. Would you guys agree with that? Or not? Or both are important. See, I'm gonna keep picking on you guys. <laughs> I love having people pick on me. Or would you say that they're equally important? Equal. Okay. Well, certainly the salt side is important because that's, that's the main one that's killing your plants. And that's the one that's making these big, ugly areas that we're trying to fix. So that's where you have to have a technology that's able to work in all of it. So our core technology that we use for soil and, and or I'm sorry, for sodium and chloride remediation reverses that. Because our polymer is both negatively and positively charged, it can go in there and reverse and hook onto that sodium molecule and replace what it's attaching to. So our molecule now pulls it back away. And because our molecule is also moving moisture into that area, 
it's going to help push the moisture in and through, get our product in there, and again, reverse what the sodium and chloride is doing. So it's a similar process to just using lots of calcium, cultivation, moisture, but the problem with that process is, is that most calcium that we use or is suggested to be used on, on projects or organics, it doesn't have the mechanisms to react immediately. They will over time. So either you're going to need tons of moisture to go ahead and keep flushing the material down and through the profile because it doesn't have a mechanism in itself to get to where the problem is. Or it doesn't have the ability because that area is still hydrophobic. You haven't done anything to change that characteristic for the ability for moisture to go ahead and get into it. That's kind of where our technology goes. We're using the same scientific principles, but how we deliver it and how we're able to go ahead and make the actual process work is all built into a single jug, a single product, to where you simply just have to dilute it and add it into water. I'm, I'm a very visual guy, so it's easier for me to understand. So when I say that as soon as sodium and chloride goes ahead and hits soil with any kind of clay content, it goes ahead and locks up. This obviously isn't going to allow a whole lot of moisture to go through. And I'm sure if you guys have seen enough produced water spills that are out and about, which I know there's a couple around the state, it's going to look very capped off. You may even see a little white sheen from the actual sodium chloride buildup that's on the top. And it's going to stay that way. And water is going to just kind of go across the top of it it's not going to percolate down and through. You're not going to see much different. This is healthier soils. This is what you need to be able to grow something. Something that's still going to have some larger pieces in it, aggregate, but is also going to be tilthy. It's going to be open. It's going to have the ability to move materials down and through. It's going to make it easier for a plant to grow in it. A plant will grow in this quickly, easy, and effectively. Not so much here. All right, hopefully we can listen and, and eat at the same time. And if you want more, you know, you, you won't bother me hopping up. I dropped this slide in because it, it gives us a good basic evaluation a lot of times when I'm looking at, at different sites. Google Earth is a magnificent thing. But this particular project actually delineated itself. So it was pretty easy to figure out where the problem was and what we had to take care of. But what helps me is in determining whether it's photo, data, had a little conversation on the break. Data is everything. So the more information we have about what the problem is, the better we're going to be able to give you a cost-effective solution to fix it. If I don't have good data, I'm just going to slam it. And I'm going to make darn sure what I'm putting in is going to cover a myriad of problems. But if I know soil dynamics, if I know more information about what we're trying to achieve, it's going to be much easier. So am I working on 8 to 18% grades? Am I trying to regenerate some natural plant material that's already there? And how degraded is that material? How long has the spill been there? So any information that we can get, and again, I like picking on OSU because I spent a lot of time developing a good sodium and chloride soils testing protocol. And that gives us a lot of information about what the soil is doing in the health of that soil. If we simply get total soluble salts, chlorides, and EC, which is the bare minimum, I can figure out a course of action and a plan to go ahead and fix it, but it doesn't necessarily tell me all the things about how the product will react within the soil. 
So we're generally going to put in a little bit more product to cover ourselves, not knowing the actual soil chemistry. Let's get into the meat and taters. That's such a good looking guy sitting over there eating. Um, simple small area, produced water spill. What's interesting is when the actual first site visit and the treatment is done, you can see these basic areas where there's Bermuda. Now Bermuda is very hardy. And Bermuda is going to grow in a lot of crappy situations, but it's good ground cover. But even in this situation, it wasn't very actively growing. Simply 13 days after application on one of the spot revisits and resampling, re you can tell a significant difference. This area right in here is this area. That area up in here is right here. Now the next slide I'm going to give you the data, but just remember, you would think if it's actively growing this aggressively that the soil or the salts and the chlorides would pretty much be gone. Not so much. At the 13 day mark, you still had 38,000 ppm chloride, I'm sorry, salts, 10,000 chlorides. Conductivity was still at 54,000. But that looked like it was growing like a house of fire. Very actively growing. Again, it's part of the process to where we're buffering that grow zone, the ability for those soils to regenerate themselves, go ahead and actively start supporting new growth. Because the first part of our process is buffering those contaminants. Turning that soil around so that moisture can go ahead and penetrate down and in. Allow the plant to go ahead and start regrowing and reestablishing itself. Sending out rhizomes and stolons to start, send those runners out, to start continuing to cover and connect these areas and get this little area back to an active pasture that surrounds a simple disposal site. <coughs> now, after 20 days, the levels continue to go ahead and drop and did very well. Now, again, this is 20 days, not six months, not eight months, not a year. <coughs> When I get to the next slide, George did both of these. Very simple process, but again, exceptionally high levels. Quick response, a simple process, and we got dynamic results. <coughs> Second location, again, same disposal site, other side. Has a similar spill, and I'm going to turn it over to George to kind of give his two cents worth in on how he prepped it, what was thrown in there to go ahead and reestablish it. Okay. So I'll take it away. All right. <clears throat> this one had much lower uh, salt levels. Uh, we came in and tilled this to a depth of about six inches, and um, then. Uh, uh, put the remediation product down and diluted it. Uh, as I recall, we used about 75 gallons of water on this particular site. Um, we, we did not have the initial testing. We went ahead and treated it early and then pulled the samples. Then, um, uh, just to prove a point that we can get germination very quickly, I went ahead and put some uh, millet and some sunflowers down. I also, uh, since we, did, we had some impact in this area on the Bermuda, I went ahead and oversprayed this area. And I, uh, after I had put down the, um, the millet and the sunflower, I also put some organic uh, fertilizer that was high in nitrogen to stimulate the um, germination here, as well as to stimulate the growth of the Bermuda. And as you can see in here, it's maybe difficult. These lighter plants or the sunflowers coming up, the millet's coming up, and this was 13 days later. 
we actually had germination in eight days or under on this. This is continuing to grow. The previous site, uh, the cattle are actually uh, grazing on the Bermuda that had the very high salt levels. This was about 16,000 parts. Yeah, on this one. And you can, yeah, you can see the sunflowers in here. From one week to the next, we were about five inches on the leaf width and it jumped about an inch and a half in a week. This is continuing to grow in from all areas. Uh, we've got, when I was up there last week, uh, we had 23 inch long runners of the Bermuda going into the sites. And these areas were also continuing to run out. So everything was starting to close in on it. So usually everybody that does presentations and things like this only gives you the good stuff. But there are a couple interesting points on, on this actual plot. The other one continued to go down naturally and it will continue to go down. But when we got our 15 day data, because this side was done a couple of days later than the other side, we actually saw two little rebound effects. Now most people would go ahead and get all excited and go, ooh, well, your product's not working. No. Again, because this one we actually treated blind, we had no data when we went into this one. We figured, well, we have a basic idea of what the other side is, so let's go into this one and treat it the same way. But the soil dynamics were completely different. So again, when I only get sodium chlorides, in conductivity, we may not necessarily know all the actual reactions that could take place. Now that we have more information, this isn't unexpected. Weather patterns, the amount of moisture that goes through, was there a possibility this is a little down gradient site? Did we get a little backwash from some heavy rains that came in? Because we only had a smaller delineation of where we thought the problem was. Again, here's the good news. I'm fine that this went and jumped back up in 15 days because the one that everybody really gets, again, the chlorides continue to go ahead and drop and will continue to remain stable. Generally, it's always the EC and the salt that we see potential rebounds. Now this, as I'll go ahead and show you on one of the later ones, let me jump ahead and then I'm going to jump back. We have the same basic effect on this site. This is a much larger site, about an acre and three quarters. Again, relatively consistent numbers that we see quite a bit here in Oklahoma. But at the 60 day mark, we actually saw the numbers ramp back up. Now this was actually treated in late spring and went into the summer. This site was also what I'll call an aged site. It wasn't a fresh spill. It had two years old. So it had plenty of time to work itself into the soils. It had been non-vegetated for a very long period of time. And again, we had limited data going in, but our treatment method, we still cultivated and we drenched. For a site about that, we're going to use roughly somewhere between 25,000 and 50,000 gallons of water per acre, depending on how many cubic yards. Now there's other companies that are out there that are recommending upwards of a couple of hundred thousand to a million gallons per acre to try to go ahead and flush it. Well, water to me is a precious commodity. I need it as a delivery platform. I need it to go ahead and help get down into the soils and do the reactions that I need, but I don't need excess amounts of water. But when we went right at about the 30 day period, here in good old Oklahoma, it went completely dry and arid. Temperature skyrocketed, got very dry. So what we experienced here was a slight wicking effect. Some of the salt started to move back up from what we had filtered down below. Now, even though these numbers went back up and the REC went above the regulatory side, above the 4,000, the, 
the revegetation that we had on this was almost completed at 60 days and did not show any negative effects. It was a pasture off of a production pad that blew a line and it basically ran down into a pasture, was right into a channel in a large grazing area. This area was reestablished right at about the 45 day point, remained stable, the cattle continued to go through and today it's still fine. But we will get reactions and responses like this. Now, this site, which was same general area, another two year site, we did a little earlier in the year. And so when we came through the springtime with the nice rains that we normally get in the spring, it just kept driving our numbers down and down and down. And by the time we got to the 60 day mark, this site was perfect. Well, we didn't start the other site until we were somewhere in here. And we went to the dry period and the numbers went and played with us. So again, our job as a company, supporting our distributors and supporting you, our customers, is to tell you the time frames, establish the appropriate expectations. Make sure that you understand it isn't a perfect downward movement. Mother Nature has a lot to do with in-situ remediation. Anything that we do on site, we need a certain help from Mother Nature. And moisture is one of those things. Moisture is always important for almost all remedial characteristics that you're going to do. So when we're doing different projects, again, we look at the amount of time frame that we have to do the project. The other these levels were relatively lower on both of these and we went a little bit lower rate because there wasn't necessarily a speed or time frame that our customer was required to go ahead and do it. He was doing it, he actually owned the land that, that the spill went on and so there wasn't a legal issue, there wasn't a mad landowner versus you know, uh, the actual oil or gas company. So this one we were a little bit more relaxed and went with a lower rate and we said we would need more time. Both these sites are completed and finished and done. So again, where we looked at those first couple, obviously the numbers on the first couple are significantly higher. The advantage that we had on these projects is that they were being done quickly. The longer you wait, the more money it costs to do it. These, all we had to do was simple surface cultivations. Rototiller or three-point attachment on the back of a tractor, go ahead and get it tilled down six to eight inches. It gets it nice and opened up. We lay the liquid treatment over the top of it. We can cultivate it again, hit it again. If you want to seed it, hit it with your seed walk away, you're done and you're finished. Mother Nature and the product does the work from there. That's what's needed. Let me step in for a second. One thing I've noticed in doing these projects over the last several years, the uh, cattle activity. Initially, I don't see much activity on that on these particular sites. But after I've gone through and done the remediation, we really see an increased activity by the cattle. Uh, both of these sites that we just recently did cattle are grazing the Bermuda and the uh, uh, millet that was put down. So it's a noticeable change. And on the other uh, older ones we did, the acre and a half and acre and three quarters, there's very little activity by the cattle. After we got through, uh, it was incredible the amount of activity. The the cattle were on the prop on the um, remediated site they were adding donations organic donations shall we say to the site and um, it was a it's a very noticeable difference by those animals so they know it's safe but they wouldn't be coming in for so the tidy up the produce water side Our product's a liquid product, and within the biopolymer, it basically captures the sodium and chloride. 
and holds it within that biopolymer. Helps free it from the soils so that it now will not have the negative Im impact to the soil structure so moisture freely can go through, plants can revegetate. But it's also going to naturally allow the sodium and chloride to safely filter down through the profile. I'm going to pick up my regulators again. Sometimes people will go ahead and say, well, all you're going to do is move the problem to the groundwater. Well, we do consider that. If you have shallow groundwater, that is something that we need to look at. We need to look at what the use of that groundwater is because there is a potential that we will filter that out of the soils and into groundwater. But once it hits the actual groundwater, it's still going to be encapsulated in our polymer. Its specific weight and gravity is still going to be heavier than water. Once it hits the groundwater, it just keeps dropping. It keeps precipitating down as it comes out of soil. But you have to also remember something. Give me three feet of soil. The amount of years that it will take to move something from the top <coughs> eight inches to three feet down in soil, unless you have perfect sandy soil, is going to take a long time. A long time. It doesn't flush down and through. As you go through different striations of soil, you may have a bedrock layer, you may have different stuff of concentrations and porosity. So the water just doesn't naturally flush down through our soils. And if we're not getting natural rainfall that's naturally continually keeping our soils open and pushing, stuff doesn't move. Again, so what we're trying to do is to dilute it to a certain degree by moving it through a little larger striation, but to negate the negative effects of it. Do not allow it to re-encapsulate into the soil. Do not allow it to become a negative because we do the same thing with heavy metals. Again, you can't digest heavy metals, but we know how to immobilize them, detoxify them, and protect them from the environment. Same thing that we're doing with sodium chloride. Not a bad thing to have it because we need a certain amount of salts in our soil to grow plants. Just not as much as we donate when we have a produced water spill. So tidying it up, our product is simple to use, cost effective, and generally your results and expectations depending on the budget and time that we have. We can get it done in fractional amounts of time in comparison to other competitive products. And we will get it done for the same cost competitiveness that most of our competition, competitions have. And we're also going to use a lot less water resources to do it, which is more important to us than anything, is we don't want to go ahead and have to use other precious resources, but we do have to use a certain amount of moisture to actually get the project done.